Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. So today is the 20th Sunday after Pentecost, and we're just finishing a uh, journey the, uh, of our first apostolic journey last night that uh, Father Giselle and I went. We left on September the 11th, and then just returned, left the United States. I left the United States September 11th. Father left France on September the 8th. And then uh, we just returned uh, last night, and we met in, uh, in Asia and the Philippines, visited uh, many people or many places in the Philippines and in Asia, and visited approximately a little more than 300 uh, faithful in Asia during the course of the last month in many places. The largest parish was one in the Philippines where about 120 people who will no longer go to the uh, the mass of the local society priests there, they refused to go to his mass and they would say that uh, because of the uh, multiple reasons, but the primary one given is that the since they, they, they don't see the Filipino people there, they don't see the distinction between agreeing to make a deal with Rome and signing a paper with Rome. So they say you agree to make a deal, you made the deal, so why should we wait for the signing of a little paper? And uh, so we, we say that it's a compromise, and we see the signs of compromise. And so for us, it's simple, no more. And so you come and say Mass for us, otherwise we are not going to go to the Mass anymore. And so the, uh, about 120 there in an island in the Leyte in the Philippines, and then also in other places, uh, various, various, when we landed in each place, usually Father Couture and uh, some other priests landed in front of us. And uh, even though we have only a few people at each of our masses, there were major attacks. Uh, one, uh, one family, uh, Joseph was the name of the man in the Philippines, in Iloilo, who um, was, uh, uh, has seven children. He receives about uh, 75 American dollars a month for his salary from the, our society. He's a gardener, he's a carpenter and a gardener, and, um, and uh, he, because he came to buy a mass, he was fired. He was fired, and now he has uh, the, uh, what do you call it, no income for his family, and uh, so that uh, he is, so he's going to find some other means of supporting his uh, seven children. And, uh, you know, he's a very poor man that uh, came into the parish when I was there as a pastor about uh, six years ago. And uh, so he was thrown out, and he was uh, fired from his uh, job, and no longer has a means of support. And then also others who were told that if you want to go to Mass, you can go to Mass in Kentucky. So from the Philippines, they can fly to Kentucky and go to Mass, and if they go to, to my Mass, they will be thrown out. And that was in Iloilo. In other places, uh, the reaction was different. The people in Cebu and Bohol were told that if you go to Father Pfeiffer and Father Giselle's Mass, we were told by Father Couture that it would be a profanation and a sacrilege to attend our Mass and that they should not speak to us. And that this is the place where I was a pastor for the last two years. And uh, Father Chazelle had been the pastor of the same parish for approximately a year, uh, a little bit before that. And uh, visiting one of the houses there, the, the servant girl came to the, to the door and then uh, they, we know that the master of the house was in but not able to get in. Visiting another house. Uh, they, they, they again uh, told us that we couldn't come in. And then, uh, but nonetheless, we have uh, the uh, group of uh, a small chapel in Dagahoy where I used to say Mass, where basically almost the whole chapel is with us, about 90% of the chapel. Again, a smaller chapel. So uh, uh, 36 uh, people from that chapel who are with us uh, strongly out of about 45 uh, people. And then the, the uh, others... Uh, in the words of say mass, they're afraid, and then and then we have contact issues with some of them, uh, and then there's uh, overall though it was a good, very educational trip. Our first apostolic uh, journey, going back into our old uh, stopping grounds in Asia, the Philippines, and then back in Singapore, we visited Singapore, and when we arrived in Singapore, uh, both of us were expelled from the Society of Saint Pius X. We received our expulsion notice. Singapore is our headquarters. Singapore is the uh, <coughs> It's the, uh, uh, the Mecca or the, uh, the height of materialistic uh, magnificence. You know, it's, it's the materialistic heaven. You know, there's no, there's no uh, uh, <clears throat> litter. There's no cracks in the concrete. Uh, 
you know, in the, if you litter, it's a death penalty, I believe. If, uh, if everything is absolutely visibly perfect and, and uh, magnificent, everything is the latest, everything is the, is the most uh, technology advanced, and if you have a, it's illegal to have a dent in your car, for instance, and you can't have a car that's over 10 years old, and, and uh, so on and so forth. They have very, very strict rules in, in Singapore, but that's where our headquarters are. And, but our parish there is about 120, 130. But out of that 130, <clears throat> that goes to our mass there. Uh, about 40 came to our mass, Father Giselle and myself, when we were there. And uh, then there's some strong, strong, small core there. And then just above um, Singapore is a, is, a, is a country, but it's a country that's 40 miles. It's one island that's 40 miles wide about 30 miles tall, that's the size of the entire country, <clears throat> and then just a very wealthy country, <clears throat> and uh, the, the hub of shipping and the hub of flying for Asia, for South, South Asia. So it's, it's uh, all shipping, all, hub, all, all transportation of modern baloney goes through there. Most of it does as it travels to the West, which is why they're uh, very uh, rich and then run by the Chinese. And uh, then above that, Singapore, Malaysia, uh, just below Thailand, we have a, a Kuala Lumpur, the KL, and we say mass, said mass there. About 20 faithful, again, out of about 80 that are in that particular parish. Then off to Korea, where uh, the Korea, there was a battle that went on in Korea that uh, the, the use of threats, the use of threats was found there. <clears throat> that uh, Father Giselle, just before we arrived back, because uh, our, our travels are not secret, so it was known that we were coming to Asia. It was known that I was coming, it was known that Father was coming. So the week before, Father Giselle came back to Korea, where he was the uh, same Mass uh, much of the time for the last year or so. Um, the, uh, the, the chapel is uh, owned by uh, uh, Dr. Kim, who is uh, a supporter of Father Giselle and myself. So Father Couture came to Dr. Kim as well as Father Onoda, the pastor, and told her, if you receive Father Giselle when he comes back from France next week, if you receive Father Giselle, then we will not say Mass for you again. There will be no more Masses for you. And uh, the belief was that by threatening the lady, that she would be afraid and drive away. But amongst the Asian peoples, the Koreans are known as the most uh, violent. They are the toughest and they are the ones who uh, when you attack them their custom is to attack back. Uh, like uh, Father pointed out that uh, in karate is designed to punch and uh, you know the various martial arts but the Korean martial art Taekwondo is only designed to kill. It is not designed for other methods. It is just simply to kill the enemy. So we don't worry about little details we just kill them. They're fighters. Of all the Asian people, they're more fighters, and so the attacking them was not really the right approach. Uh, <clears throat> but nonetheless, <clears throat> it was a gamble that Father Couture made that was a mistake. He attacked them and told them, <clears throat> if you allow Father to come to say Mass here, then we will never say Mass here again. A few days later, Father came. He was received in the chapel. Then uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the Dr. Kim called us, said, well, should, what should we do about Father? Because the chapel or the society says Mass, what should I do about Father Couture and Father Onoda. <clears throat> he said, well, you let them come in and say the Mass. So they did come in and say the Mass. And then they said, we're going back to uh, Philippines and we're going back to Singapore now. And uh, they didn't go back. They stayed for another couple days. And then they came in and uh, took the sledgehammer and broke open the door of the chapel, went in, took the vestments, took all of the candles, well, the, most of the candlesticks and most of the things, and took them all out uh, of the chapel. And then they set up another chapel on the other side of the town. All of this could have been easily avoided. Dr. Kim told them, as did Father Chazelle, uh, that uh, you only have Mass one Sunday a month in Korea. And so when we come, it'll be another Mass. Uh, but you shouldn't, uh, there's no need to, to uh, we'll, we'll tell them our side of the theological crisis of the society. You tell them the other side, they can get both sides, and then they can decide what they want to follow. And uh, the hope was to stop us to have any kind of base. There was an over-violent reaction. The end result was that they ended up making good on their threat, pulled out of the chapel, and then told other people that it was Father Giselle who broke into the chapel. Uh, of course, at the time, of the, we were not 
neither of us were in Korea. We were in the Philippines and, and, uh, and uh, didn't uh, actually know about the break-in until afterwards. Uh, and then, so that uh, the, with Father Couture and Father Onoda, the broken of the chapel and so on and so forth. So a big battle in the Korea. And even though it's a small chapel of about 70, what, I mean 50 people normal mass, all together would be about 80 people in the parish. Uh, the, it could be a microcosm of uh, things to come. And uh, the, uh, so, uh, the result of that was that uh, we, we were able to, uh, there, half the parish coming to our Mass this, uh, this, uh, this last Sunday when we were in Korea. Then in Japan, <coughs> visiting Japan, one family that uh, is supportive and, uh, and another family not able to visit because it was big in Japan, but then we especially were able to make the acquaintance again of Father Narihai, a, a, a traditional priest, a Japanese traditional priest, 77 years old, who is uh, in, uh, very happy to receive us, who are not allowed to visit him over the last several years because he was considered uh, a bad priest on the outside, but he has been very strong and, and preserved the tradition. And the same, the Mass, it just had a little political falling out with a local priest, local society priest. And again, a few false accusations, and then a, people told not to really go to, or encouraged to not go to his Mass. And then now he's been isolated from other traditional priests now for about nine years. And so for the first time to be able again connect with the traditional priest was when Father Giselle and I visited him uh, a few days ago, last week. And uh, so he was very happy to uh, receive us. On uh, uh, last week, and Father Narihai is uh, you now is uh, is uh, joining us. The Japanese priest joining us in the fight. The first Asian priest to uh, strongly uh, join us. Other priests are a little <clears throat> interested, but in South America, the priests seem to be rising up more and more. We're going to try to have a South American priest meeting in the next few weeks, uh, and the uh, so that uh, can, can form together a. Uh, a strong uh, resistance uh, against the modernism, because remember that what we are fighting is modernism. Modernism is what we're fighting. The deal, the so-called siding of the deal, all that is is the conclusion. That's just the effect of the modernism. The new modernist uh, direction of the society of St. Pius X, which is coming from the top, there's always been, and there always will be, we must expect in our modern world that there'll be some liberal priests and conservative priests and the uh, you know, different, uh, uh, amongst the priests, you'll find different, different directions because of the crisis of the church. But in this case, we have a situation where the liberals have floated to the top. The liberals have all the reins of power. The liberals are pushing the liberal agenda. The liberals are smashing those that are not liberal. And that is not a case of, okay, this priest is weak, and that priest is uh, not perfect, and this priest is, you know... Uh, not doing perfectly, but nobody's perfect. It's a time of crisis. We're talking about an organized liberalization within the society. And we also have seen some signs that this uh, organization may go deeper than what we would originally have thought. That this or this, the, there's a, there is an, a push. The liberalism is not just a case of weakness because of the pressure of the modern world. That there is something more behind it. That there are those who are pushing in a planned and ordered and structured way, a modernization, a modernist direction of the society. There are the useful idiots, there are the weak ones, there are the ones that are just trying to do the right thing and they're, they're confused, but then there are those who are pushing liberalism in an ordered and structured way over many years. And that this is this, these are the signs, or the evidences tend to be coming out. And uh, we see also that uh, it has been a great blessing, our being a, the ex expulsion from the society, uh, no solid foundation, and of course remember that an expulsion in the, in, in, in the eyes of God, which has no solid foundation in a religious order, is, is basically meaningless. Uh, but to nonetheless, to, uh, to receive the, the expulsion, I was in uh, October the 3rd, I received my expulsion notice in Singapore. Uh, Father Couture, of course, the superior, he wasn't there, he's gone much of the time. He wasn't there to hand us our expulsion notices. Another priest, a delegate, handed it uh, to us, myself on October the 3rd, the Feast of St. Teresa, and <coughs> Father Giselle on his patron saint feast day of October the 4th, the Feast of St. Francis 
received the uh, expulsion notice. And now, just a couple days ago, the public notice has been made that Bishop Williamson is about to be expelled as well. And of course, they've been talking about that expulsion for at least four years. It's been an ongoing uh, rumor of his expulsion, but now apparently it's finally coming to fruition. Our battle is a battle of faith. It's not a battle of anything else. And that, uh, that when we're fighting the battle of faith, the faith is ex must be expressed. The faith must be taught and the faith must be lived. But the faith must be taught. And uh, even uh, talking to my brother in the Philippines, I was able to visit him, and uh, even he had to admit that there are things that he's not able to say. That this rule of silence that was put upon Father Zazel and myself, which we refuse to obey, and other priests also, we're counting together the priests that are against what's going on. We have 27 now, 27 priests. But of course, some of these priests are, are uh, friends of the society and not uh, members of the society. And, uh, and of course, these priests are all over the world and independent, spread out in different places. And not all these priests will travel the circuit. Some of them are only taking care of their own little parishes and so on. But still 27 priests who are... Uh, the uh, actively speaking out against the liberalism going on within the society and are actively uh, taking steps. And then, in fact, we, we discovered two or three more of them, new ones, on this, uh, this particular trip uh, in Asia. And that uh, there are signs that others are ready to rise up as well as this crisis of faith tends, extends and grows. The refusing of Holy Communion, the firing of people, uh, the, the, the threats arrived in England the same time that we did. We arrived in England. Uh, we arrived in England uh, on uh, Wednesday, the day before our arrival. The threats were made that those who uh, uh, involved in the Ignis Ardennes, or just shortly before our arrival, the Ignis Ardennes, that they should be refused Holy Communion if they don't step down. And uh, so the uh, this, uh, this this and that there was a word from uh, on high that uh, that this is coming from Bishop Fillet himself that there must that those who speak out against will be punished and that those who spoke out against or those who spoke negatively about the deal with Rome those who spoke negatively about the the society's leadership before the general chapter we let them slide anyone speaks up afterwards then let them die and uh, so that uh, there is uh, this uh, crushing is continuing. And uh, in fact, as I mentioned in the sermon on May 27th, that after the, uh, after the general chapter, that after this summer would be the time of the purge. And we are now experiencing in a heavy way this purge. There is a very <laughs> strong uh, negative reaction, much stronger actually than we expected, uh, that uh, to our visit, visiting even though we visited a total of over 300 people uh, in, a, in, the, in the Asian district, which really isn't that large in population, though it's large in area, uh, the nonetheless it's still a very small number. And that, uh, but there is a grave uh, attack against us and a grave attack against this work, uh, and it's a sign, it's a real sign that that uh, the devil is unhappy and a sign that we're, we're doing the right thing before God. And meanwhile, as we persevere in the battle, just speaking the truth, we find that those priests uh, that are attacking us are very agitated, very agitated. Trying to speak to some of them, they're not able to sit still. They're not able, even speaking to my superior, he was not able to sit still, is not able to talk for a long period of time, goes out of the room, walks away, not able to explain. One of the things we were told during this trip is that, remember, priests have to go to confession as well. And uh, Father Couture told the priests in Philippines to not absolve us of our sins and to refuse absolution. Uh, Father Chazelle found out by going to confession to one of the priests and he was refused absolution. And uh, so that, uh, and then when speaking to other priests, they refused absolution. When we asked Father Couture, why are we being refused absolution? Why is it that you're saying on the priest who should not refuse absolution? And he said he refused to answer, refused to, to answer the question or to explain. Now normally if you come to me and you say, uh, Father, why are you refusing me Holy Communion? We must tell you, since it's a public refer refusing of Holy Communion, it's because you are living in sin with somebody who is not your husband, living in sin with someone who is not your wife, 
You're in public incubinage. You're in a grave public scandal that the whole world can see that is a true scandal. And that is an objective, a clear, mortal sin uh, that is pertinacious. And these are the reasons why you're being refused Holy Communion. But when we asked our superior why we're being refused confession, he would not respond and would not respond to our questions. And so the, the priest told to refuse us Holy Communion. We were not allowed to celebrate Mass on the altars in Manila. Whereas Father Chazelle, when he went to Menzingen, he celebrated Mass in the chapel of the society headquarters with the permission of Bishop Filet. When we were in Manila, we were not allowed to even say private Masses on the side altars. Even though there's, it's a big church, but there's many times when there's no one in the church. There could have easily had a Mass in which there were no witnesses. We are forbidden that. So therefore, Father said the Mass on the streets on Sunday, and uh, there was, uh, they were upset about that. And then Father said, oh, you can say Mass in your room. Well, we were not supposed to say Mass in our room when there's a church down the street. I mean, as in down the, not down the street, but down the stairs. Right? And obviously that would be a sinful thing to do, to say Mass in your room, unless there's 50 priests present and there's no way to, uh, no other option. And then furthermore, if they're going to let us say Mass in our room, then where is my candlesticks? Where is my chalice? Where is my vestments? Where is my server? Where is my altar cloth? They have gave nothing. No wine, no host. In fact, just in case, because we have keys to Manila, Father Onoda changed the keys to the sacristy, just in case we might go in to get a chalice, or we might go in to get hosts. But of course, because we had our mass kits, we were able to celebrate the mass. Changing the locks, refusing uh, to, uh, to allow us to say the mass, uh, and not explaining the reason why. We were not allowed to eat with the other priests. When we went down to uh, Davao, Father Tim, my brother, allowed us to eat with him, allowed us to say Mass. Father Couture told him, you can't do that. And he said, well, I'm going to do it. And he said, okay, I give you an indult. So they say, he tells one person that it is a sacrilege and a profanation to go to our Mass. Another one stands a bit stronger and he says, okay, you got an exception. Another person is told, it's okay to let Father... When we go to Singapore, there were some strong people who were not going to be told no by Father Couture. And so he told them, well, you know, um, the father needs a place to say Mass. It's okay to let him say Mass in your house. So one gets told one thing, another gets told another, another gets told another. There's one rule here, there's another rule there. And these are signs that we're not following, or they are not following principles. If our Mass is truly a profanation and sacrilege in Cebu, it's a profanation and sacrilege in Davao. It's a profanation and sacrilege in whatever place that we celebrate the Holy Sacrifice. So that, and if it is a profanation and sacrilege, why is it a profanation and sacrilege? And so these, these, uh, these uh, <clears throat> disjointed attacks, these violent attacks, and the violence seems to be increasing. But what is interesting is that many of the faithful are wondering, why is this going on? What's the reason? And the explanation is not given. We told the faithful of Korea, you should know both sides. We are explaining to you, as we have always said for the last 40 years, you need to know your faith. It is not enough. We tell you you shouldn't go to the new Mass, and you shouldn't go to the new Mass, but why? You should know why. You should be able to know by studying your catechism and knowing your faith why the new Mass is a sacrilege, why the new Mass is, is damaging to souls, and why we should go to the traditional Mass. We should know the reason of our faith, and we should not be afraid of the attacks of those in error. And if we are standing on the truth, then we can stand on the truth. We have a firm foundation. We're not afraid of the attacks of our enemies. And one of the signs that the, those who are trying to attack two crazy padres, or five crazy padres, now 27 crazy padres, what, why those trying to attack them from all different backgrounds, those trying to attack them should be able to attack them by saying, these priests are teaching this error. These priests are making this grave mistake. These priests are doing this grave error, and here is the answer. This is not being done. What is being done? Vatican II. The bishop knows best. We've heard that 65 billion times over the last 40 years. The bishop knows best. Trust him, he's got the grace of state. You must be obedient. The faithful don't know anything. There are more intelligent people than you. The intelligent, uh, the intelligent argument has been used many times. You, there are people that know more than you. There are people that know more than you. There are people that do know more than, than any of us everywhere on earth. 
But the truth is something that we can grab onto. We know the truths of our faith. And so these attacks of the last few, uh, few weeks have in fact helped solidify the faithful and, and, uh, and, have, uh, and have also helped solidify our position. And uh, we are standing for the truth, teaching the same thing we used to teach and we have always taught. And why is it now? If it is true that Bishop Filet has backtracked, if it is true that he's no longer going to make a deal with Rome, if it is true that he admitted that he made a mistake, then why still punish those who say it was a mistake? Why still punish? We were expelled after these announcements. And of course, there is this, the, the, there is this expulsion isn't really of any serious value. And uh, so it is, uh, we just have to persevere in teaching the faith. And then to say that you're being disobedient, why are we being disobedient? Because of doctrine. And that is the foundation of the whole disobedience of the Society of St. Pius X and every traditional priest down the last 40 years. Being disobedient to the local bishop, being disobedient to the pope, being disobedient to the local the religious superior of the religious order. Why? Because of the faith. And this disobedience is required by God. And to obey in these circumstances would be a false obedience. And that's the whole foundation of the last 40 years. It's not something new to us. And yet now it's being thrown upon us, this, new, this uh, false disobedience. And that's something that's no excuse to be a, for a traditional Catholic to fall into that trap. We must know our faith better than that. And then, um, in any case, so it was a good uh, apostolic uh, uh, journey. We met some strong faithful in, in England uh, a few days ago. And, uh, and, you know, and again, we meet place meeting small numbers but strong numbers. And, uh, and, then, and then also, uh, why are they afraid? Why is there fear of us? There should be no fear of us because we, are, we have uh, proven ourselves to be idiots over many years. There, no, there is no need to fear us. The fear is the fear of the truth. It is the truth that is to be feared. Because no matter how many times you push down the truth, it tends to crop up. And one of the signs that we're doing the right thing is that the priests who are standing up, many of them, we don't know each other. We're meeting each other for the first time. A German priest calling me and speaking to me and I'm talking to him for the first time. I never met him before in my life. And also the same thing with the Spanish priests and the many priests of South America and then the priests of some of the priests in Europe and, 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 and of course you know, throughout the world, same thing amongst the faithful, fighting for the faith. We are united in the fight for the faith. And, and the negative side of what's going on within the society is that it seems as though it's rather a, a, a problem of the cult of a person. It's the cult of Bishop Filet, the cult of a person, that this person cannot make a mistake because he is holy. This person cannot make a mistake because he has the grace of state. This person cannot make a mistake because he's the head of the Society of St. Pius X, which is infallible, indefectible, and impeccable. And so that this, this idea is inside of many souls, and it's a false idea. The Society of St. Pius X is not the Catholic Church. It is an order within the Catholic Church which is working for the salvation of souls and the spreading of the faith and the combating of errors as, a, as an order of the Church. But it is not the Church and cannot be used to take the place of the Church. So in any case, the, um, uh, it's, the, it was a good apostolic journey. Now we return back to the, to, 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 to the United States. And uh, during the course of this journey, at least two more priests have joined us. Father Vargas has joined us from Mexico. Uh, and uh, Father Vargas is a Mexican priest who was stationed in uh, Argentina. And just yesterday, Father Ortiz arrived in the United States. Uh, Father Ortiz is in uh, Virginia now with uh, Father Ringros. And uh, yesterday also, uh, three of us landed. Uh, Father Ortiz came uh, to Washington, D.C. Then myself, Father Giselle, returned uh, to the United States. <clears throat> but Father Ortiz is a Colombian priest who was with us in the Philippines, who is, who is uh, uh, a society priest ordained in the 1980s, and uh, the, is, he is uh, he's a Spanish-speaking priest, but he was many years in the English-speaking world. And uh, so he's, he's going to be here in the United States, uh, probably helping Father Ringrose and helping in a few other places as well. And so uh, more priests are joining the battle. We've got to pray for more priests to join the battle. And again, the... The faithful need to stand strong 
And remember, as Father Giselle said earlier, a few weeks ago, uh, to be, there's going to have to be, our Lord is going to demand a test. There's going to be a test. There's always been a test from the very beginning of time. The first test was given by God. St. Thomas Aquinas pointed that out. In the very beginning of time, before the devil fell, when there was no devil, God gave a test. The test is not only from the devil, the test is from God. God gave a test to the angels, and one-third of the angels failed. And then God gave a test. God was the one who created the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God was the one that placed it in the middle of the garden of paradise. And God was the one that told Adam, there it is, now don't eat it. And so God created the first test. Why did he create this test? And St. Thomas says he created the test in order that, that Adam and the angels might make a free, noble act of choosing to love God. But how could we make that free, noble act unless there was another option? If there's only one option, you're like sheep going down the chute, then there is no test. You just only have one option. But in order that we might make a free noble act worthy of salvation and worthy of glory, there had to be another option. And so St. Thomas says there was nothing wrong with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was a perfectly wonderful tree. It just wasn't good for Adam. And so that it was a, it was a good tree created by God, which was created in part to be a test to Adam. The only thing wrong was Adam's eating of the fruit. There was nothing wrong with the fruit itself. And so that God created the first test. And whenever we're going to go towards God, there's going to have to be a test. When there's a passing of the test, when there's a going through the test, then God sends blessings. And then there will be more tests. But He sends blessings. And to receive a little persecution for the sake of Christ is a great privilege and a great honor. And uh, so that we should not be disturbed, we should not be angry, we should not be frustrated when we receive a little persecution or a little assault. And remember, nowadays, the assaults and persecutions that we receive are nothing compared to what our fathers received down the last 2,000 years. But we receive in a very soft persecution. And, uh, and, uh, but to be able to receive some test, there must be a test, we must pass the test. And it looks as though the threats of the last few weeks and months, particularly the last month, are going to continue. And that God is going to ask that some are going to have to be strong and make it past the test. So many people are saying, Father, I'm on your side. Father, I completely agree with you. Father, I'm 100% behind you, but I have to watch over my family. I've got to be responsible. The example of today is Tobias. He's the example for our times. Tobias, who was not responsible. Tobias, who jeopardized his family. Tobias, who went out and took the dead bodies of the Jews and brought them into his house, which was the death penalty. Tobias, who abandoned his family to go to Jerusalem in order to worship when he should have been at home, taking care of his kids. And Tobias, who, in the exhausted from the work of jeopardizing his family by burying the dead at night, by putting the dead bodies in his house, fell asleep under a wall, and then he was blinded by the dung of a bird. And then Tobias was saved by an angel, and became one of the great saints of history. We are at a time in which we need more Tobiases. We need less prudent men, we need less responsible men, and more Tobiases. It is a time in which it is time for men to rise up and be warriors again. And this is the time to be. Like in the speech of Henry V, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers. This is the time to go into battle. This is the time that we have all lived for. You remember Father Giselle? In the, in the, uh, he was a bit sluggish earlier on this year. But when the May crisis hit, and Father Giselle got up and says, I was born for this. And he started running around making more models. <laughs> and so that there are times. This is a time. This is a great time. This is a time to be in battle. And that if we're going to be persecuted for the truth, and we're going to be persecuted even by our own, this is no reason to be angry, no reason to be upset. It is a reason to go to battle. And when we see the fight of the enemy, the Blessed Virgin Mary is able to overcome all the enemies. And we shouldn't be worried that they are, we are small in numbers. We shouldn't be worried that uh, some stand and others don't. Or today I feel strong and tomorrow I feel weak and the next day I don't know what I feel like. And so we should rather just stand 
for the truth and be ready to die for the truth and be ready to suffer for the truth a little bit and in the end we are guaranteed victory. We know we have victory. So we need more Tobiases. We need more souls that are ready to stand up and suffer. Joseph, the man I told you about in the Philippines who has, has lost his job, even though he's a, he's a poor man, he has no, he has, he has, he's very happy. He's not worried at all. And so he lost his job from the Society of St. Pius X. He is uh, going to have, he doesn't know where he's going to be able to feed his family over the next, uh, his seven children over the next month. We gave him a little something for a short time. Uh, but nonetheless, he, but he's not worried. He's not worried. He's not upset. So he was fired. What does he care? He's not worried at all. And so we need more souls that are ready to accept the attacks. And remember, don't resort to bitterness. Don't resort to anger. Uh, there is, you know, we have our first one to refuse Holy Communion here in America, in this parish. Now we're going to have more. There's more where that came from. And uh, we've got to be ready to stand for the fight, and then God will bless us and not be discouraged. I'm close to that. God bless you all. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.